Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Um, welcome to our third event in our brain, Building Brain Awareness to Help Brain Injury webinar series. We are um, Synapse at the University of Oregon, an organization whose purpose is to serve, support, and advocate for local brain injury survivors. We help organize and foster opportunities and programs for community members as a way to combat social isolation and increase awareness for the brain injury community. We do this through peer support programs, social events, educational webinars, and symposium series such as this. We hope to create long lasting and meaningful connections and encouragement for the brain injury community. As an advocate for individuals living with brain injury, we here at Synapse at the University of Oregon are so grateful you all decided to join us today for the live presentations. We wanna send a huge thank you to all of our wonderful guest speakers joining us today and in the coming weeks. So we have two amazing speakers today. We have Dr. Gulich, who received his BS in psychobiology from the University of California, Riverside, and later his PhD in biology from the University of Texas in San Antonio. He then conducted postdoctoral research at the Australian National University as an NSF International Research Fellow and at the National Institute for Physiological Sciences in Japan. Dr. Gulich joined the faculty of Dartmouth Medical School as an assistant professor in physiology in 2007 and has been associate professor in physiology and neurobiology since January 2015. And then later, we have Dr. Hagler, who received his BA in biology from Northwestern University in 1996, and later his PhD in biology from UCSD. He researches many different areas of brain morphology, specializing in attention, which is what we're going to hear about today, and, his, and he is currently located at the University of California in San Diego. So before we start with Dr. Gulich, I just want to ask everyone if you have a question to please put it in the chat. Um, we will be answering questions after each presenter has um, given their spiel. So um, did you want to give a quick introduction as well, Daniel? Oh, uh, yeah, I was just going to say very quickly, like, um, I think the talks today are interesting and kind of in the spirit of what this seminar uh, was intended to show. We have, you know, experts talking about what is known about in the brain and how the brain works very specific um, systems or features of the brain. And the question, you know, I wanted to just raise or to leave people with is thinking about, so what happens when you have a brain injury and these parts of your brain don't work so well, or either they're functioning less or they're damaged or they're gone. And I think, um, especially for people without a brain injury, I think that this is something that many people have to deal with. And it's, um, it's not really known. It's not really talked about. The research is more discovering these features of the brain than you even knowing when this is missing, you know, what that means, but um, it doesn't mean it's not happening to people. So that's it. And I'm looking forward to the talks too. So cool. Okay. So I'll share a screen and uh, hopefully this is working. You see a screen? Yes. Okay. Good. So um, thanks, Dan and Emily. Um, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm somebody who my whole life has been interested in, in how biology generates um, thought, right? How, do, how does biology generate this, this uh, conscious cognitive being? Um, and so I got, went into neurobiology. And today I'm I'm going to talk not so much about my own research, but kind of a general question about how um, the brain works, especially the neocortex works, and, and an interesting feature that I don't think is often appreciated about um, a fundamental aspect of brain biology. So I'm going to start by, um, you know, suggesting that, in fact, an important part of brain function is to make predictions, very immediate predictions about the world around us and what it, it is expected to be in the very near future. So as an example, um, there might've been a time when you were um, on some stairs in your house in the dark and maybe carrying something up from the basement and you are very familiar with these stairs. You walk up and down these stairs all the time, but sometimes you, you know, you kind of get 
dislocated from where you are and you might think there's another step. And so your foot comes down expecting there to be a step and there's not one there. And there's this sudden sense of surprise and um, uncertainty about what's going on, right? Alternatively, it could happen at the bottom of the steps, right? Where you miscount again and you either think there's one more step to go and your foot hits a solid floor or you hit a solid floor that you didn't expect to be there because you thought there were more steps going down. Another example would be at a power outage in your house and you, your, or the lights go out and you go over looking for a light switch and you're again, very familiar with your house and you put your hand out and you can almost feel the wall and the light switch as your hand gets there and yet it hits just a wall and there's no light switch. And for a moment you're disoriented and you kind of move your hand around. As soon as your hand hits the light switch or something else you're familiar with, you instantly know where you are and feel much more comfortable about things. <clears throat> and a third example, um, an everyday example is, you know, we are um, engaged in our environment all the time. So in this picture, we have somebody tossing keys to another uh, person. Maybe they're switching who's driving this car, right? So this looks like a, this is an easy task for us. We do this all the time. We don't even put much thought into it, right? Someone tosses us the keys and we grab them, but it's actually a very complex task, right? We have to recognize, perceive that there's keys in the air. We have to perceive that they're there because somebody wants us to have them, right? We need to be able to predict where they're going to be in the near future based on their trajectory. And we need to come up with a plan, a motor plan that will get our hand out into space at the right time, at the right place to catch those keys. And we do all of that in less than one second without any mental effort at all, right? So that's, that's a, a pretty amazing thing, right? So how do we think about cognition? We generally think of it as a fairly linear thing, right? We think of it as we have some sensory input from the world around us, something that, it, that we see or we hear or we touch. And then in this black box of our brain, there's some computation done. And then we generate behavior, some output. And that behavior often will have some impact on the world around us, right? And so we change that sensory input. And so we change the computation and then we generate new behavior, right? But there's something missing here in this, in this diagram. And one of the important things that's missing is that part of the computation is the generation of expectations of what is about to occur. And those expectations, moment by moment, you know, whether it's an expectation that there's gonna be a floor under our foot when we get to the bottom of the stairs, or that there's a light switch on the wall, or that the keys are going to be in, you know, in the next moment near our hand. Um, those contribute to our computations themselves, right? As feedback. And they also feed back into how we perceive sensory input. In fact, it's a very strong influence on our very perception of reality. So to show that, um, this diagram, which was developed by a professor at MIT is kind of interesting. So all of us can look at this and, and we instantly know what it is, right? It's a, a game board for checkers or chess, and it's got some object on it. It's, a, you know, it's, a, it's instantly recognizable, nothing particular special about it. But if I were to ask you to like look at these two squares and tell me what's interesting about those squares, well, you might say, okay, well, they're, that, that's kind of the movement that a knight would make in the game of chess, right? And one of the squares is dark and one of the squares is light. Um, otherwise, they look like all the other squares on the board. There's nothing particularly special about them. But if I were to tell you that those, those squares are exactly the same color, 
that might surprise you, right? And I could prove that to you just by moving these squares out together so that you can see they're in fact the same color. But that might not convince you because you might say, Alan, I saw the color change actually as they were moving, you were changing the color of the squares. So that these four squares are not the same color. You did something to this one to make it the same color, right? Well, what if I just build a bridge from this square to this square? Now I can show you that they're the same color. In fact, I can extend that square down to here and show you that all three of these squares are in fact the same color. And if we were to look at the pixel, what the setting for color on these pixels are, they're all the same. And yet knowing that, when I show you this photo, this picture, you can't help but see them as different colors. So why is that? Why is, why is your brain deceiving you into thinking that they're different colors? Well, it's because we have expectations about how shadows work. We live in a world of shadows. And so our brain interprets shadows to change the, our interpretation of what we're seeing in shadows. And, and we can't escape it even when we know that that information is, is incorrect or misleading. So another example from, you know, kind of popular culture over the past decade was this picture that came on the internet. Um, and there was a big debate among people of whether this is a picture of a blue dress or a picture of a white dress. And um, again, it, it, it's purely about what kinds of expectations your brain is generating about the color and shadow um, affecting this visual image, right? So neither is right or wrong necessarily, although I've heard that the dress is actually blue. Um, but our, in, our, our self-generated expectations of what the situation is, is influencing how we perceive these, these colors. So how, how does the brain do that? How does the brain generate um, these expectations and, and allow them to integrate and influence our perceptions? So uh, this is the neocortex, this area here, and it's the outermost part of our brain. And it's the most recently um, developed part of our brain. And in humans, it's quite large. Um, it's not uniform. We know that although the cellular structure is, is similar throughout the cell types that are there, the types of neurons and transmitters are similar, the cortex is divided into subregions that actually uh, process different types of information, right? So um, we have what's called the primary visual cortex in the very back of our brain. And that's an area of cortex that receives visual input from the retina via the thalamus, right? It's the first part of the cortex that gets new information from our eyes. We also have a primary somatosensory cortex. And so this area is the first part of the cortex to get new input from sensory receptors in our skin that detect touch and temperature and pain. And we have a primary auditory cortex, which is the per first part of the cortex that receives information from our ears in terms of hearing sounds, right? These three primary areas are very low level processing parts of the cortex. So if we only had a primary visual cortex, we wouldn't be able to recognize anything that we saw, right? We wouldn't be able to recognize shapes or people or, or identify things. And the same thing is true for primary sensory cortex and primary auditory cortex. They're, they're very low level processing. So we need higher level processing if we're gonna be able to see um, and identify trees and you know individuals based on on their face and other characteristics so we have higher order cortices secondary cortices and tertiary cortices and even higher order places in cortex that um, are devoted to more complex processing of information 
from these three sensory inputs. For instance, in the visual cortex, we'll have places that process motion or process color, or even places that can recognize faces. You'll notice that some of these areas of cortex, you know, as you start to expand out, you get closer to other somatosensory areas. So some areas actually get input from both visual and auditory input, or both visual and somatosensory input, and are very high, what we call associational cortices that can, can take in information from lots of different places and do very high level types of uh, analysis with that information. But how does the information get there? Well, these primary areas, like the primary visual cortex, has the cells there have axons that go to these secondary areas and transmit neural information to these higher order cortices. And these cortices continue to pass information to higher and higher order cortical areas, right? And at each step of the way, the information has got more complex and more processed as it goes up this kind of hierarchical order of cortical areas. We call these bottom-up connections, right? And they convey updated sensory information about the world, right? Processed at whatever level that area of cortex works. It could be a very basic level or it could be a very complex level. But as it moves information to higher level cortices, that's kind of a bottom-up um, drive of sensory information. We also have connections that go the other way from higher order cortices back down to lower order cortices. And we call these top-down connections, sometimes feedback connections that convey updated context and expectation for what the, these lower order cortices should be seen next, according to their higher level analysis. I should point out that this is true in the, in the motor cortex as well. We have a primary motor cortex and this primary motor cortex sends axons to motor systems in the spinal cord and can affect movement of, of limbs, right? But we have higher order motor cortex that can process more elaborate kind of coordinated behaviors and even to the point in the very frontal cortex of thoughts and ideas and plans. And these areas are also connected by these bottom up and top down connections. In, in just the same way as these sensory areas are. So the question is, okay, we have these connections. What about the cortex allows it to compare these things, this top-down and bottom-up information and make sense of it? And um, to, to, to describe that, I need to talk about neurons. And before I talk about neurons, I am going to digress for a minute and I'm gonna give you all the shortest ever neurobiology course. So I love neurons. I'm a neurobiologist. Neurons are really special, but um, what makes them special stems from something that's a common property of all cells on earth. And that is that all cells are batteries. So you're all familiar um, with the AAA battery, for instance, right? Um, and batteries use ions we have lithium ion batteries, we have nickel batteries, we have batteries that use ions to store charge in batteries. Cells also are batteries and they use ions to store and move electrical charge too, um, that are dissolved ions in the liquid that's outside the cell and the liquid that's inside the cell. So for a battery, like a AAA battery, we can measure it's voltage, right? We can use one of these little devices you can pick up at Home Depot and we just compare the voltage across the ends of this battery. And we see that if it's a nice fresh battery, a AAA battery, it'll be 1.5 volts and all is good. We can do the same exact thing with cells. We can put an electrode inside the cell and one outside the cell and we can make the exact same measurement. And here we have about one tenth of a volt on the order of anyway, between the inside and outside of the cell. So this is the battery that is the cell. Okay. 
So batteries we use to do work, right? This, this, this potential that we have in the battery we use to do work. And if we hook up, say, a light bulb to these ends here, it turns on, right? We can use that, that power in the battery to light up a room, say. Cells also use this voltage across the membrane to do work. They use it to transport things across the membrane. They use it to regulate their osmotic balance. Um, lots of different things. And so it's a common property, whether you're a, a single cell organism floating in the ocean, or you're a fungus or a plant cell, or a liver cell in a human being, it doesn't matter. You, all of the cells have this property and it's a necessary property for them to have. What about neurons? So neurons have this, this voltage. Here's an example. This is just a very simple cell with a plasma membrane around it. It's got a nucleus and it's got this, these salty um, ions dissolved inside and outside to slightly different proportions. And it's really the permeability of this membrane to ions that generates this ability to be a battery. And all cells have this, as I said. But what neurons have evolved to do that's really special is neurons have evolved to dynamically control the permeability of this membrane. And so they can change what this permeability is. And when they do that, they change the voltage on this battery. So for instance, if we were to measure permeability of the membrane and the voltage of the membrane over time, and we were to change that permeability, we would see that the voltage changes just exactly in correspondence to that permeability change. And neurons use this ability to have a dynamic permeability of the membrane to encode information in voltage changes. That's the secret. That's the secret of neurons. They use a common property of all cells in a dynamic way to encode information. So here's the last slide in this class here. Neurons are typically not round spherical cells. They have um, structures, very interesting and, and beautiful structures in many cases. Um, we typically think of neurons as having a cell body, which is that kind of the central place that has the nucleus and builds proteins, et cetera. And then there's a, a dendritic tree, all these wonderful dendrites that provide surface area for synaptic connections. And then we have an axon where a cell can use an axon as a conduit to pass information downstream to, to neurons far away, right? Maybe many neurons far away. And so in this structure, there are two important places where neurons regulate that permeability of the membrane. They regulate their local voltage. And one of them is at synapses. So synapses are little points of contact between one neuron and another um, that allow for this dynamic change in voltage. I'm showing you here a few just arbitrary example places where you might find an excitatory synapse. There's actually gonna be many hundreds on this dendritic tree. Um, and excitatory synapses are places where um, an excitatory neuron that makes contact here can change the voltage locally right at the synapse. And that looks like this. So we have a, a membrane potential at the synapse. And when the synapse is activated, we actually make that potential smaller, okay? And this looks like it's going up, but in fact, this number is actually a very negative voltage, maybe close to one-tenth of a volt negative. And when these excitatory synapses go off, the membrane becomes less negative. And so we see this change in voltage only for a few milliseconds. It's a very, very rapid change. We also have inhibitory synapses in this dendritic tree and maybe on the cell body itself. And these also cause changes in local voltage. And this time they actually make the, the battery stronger. They make the battery a bigger, more negative number, but just transiently for just a few milliseconds. 
And we generally think of, of this kind of interaction between all of these synapses happening as going kind of from the dendrites to the cell bodies, to the axon, to this very special place at the base of the cell, which is called the axon initial segment. And so if we were to record the electrical response of this axon initial segment over time, and here's its battery, and we activated a pattern of excitatory inhibitory inputs all over the dendrite, we would see that voltage change in response, right? This voltage is gonna change. And what we see is that at certain threshold voltages, we get action potentials. These, are, these spikes right here are called action potentials. And these are waves of voltage change that travel down the axon and allow this cell to activate synapses on many more cells downstream. And we also have under, you know, the, all this subthreshold computation which is just the net effect of all these little synapses, all their voltage changes interacting with each other at the axon hiller to, to decide whether or not to have the generation of an action potential in the cell. Okay, so that's, that's my little class on neurons and how neurons work. So what does that have to do with how we understand the cortex and what it does with comparing expectation with reality, because it's a really a fundamental feature of cortical processing. <clears throat> to do that, we have to look inside the cortex. So if we were to, to, to burrow down into the cortex, we would find that there are many different things there. There's many neurons of different types. Um, and the main type of neuron are these types of neurons that are right here in this, in this picture here. So in this picture, this is the surface of the brain and this is going down into the brain, deeper and deeper and deeper into the brain. And it's about one millimeter tall, this, this, this bit of brain here, which is about the thickness of, of the, the, the uh, part of the neocortex that has a lot of neurons in it. So, these neurons are called pyramidal cells, and they are the primary type of excitatory cortical neuron. They make up maybe 80% of the neurons in the neocortex. And they're called pyramidal cells because their, their cell bodies kind of look like triangles um, or pyramids. And they have some interesting anatomical features or morphological features. One is that from the apex of this pyramid, we have what's called the apical dendrite that goes toward the surface of the brain. And when it gets kind of close to the surface, it branches into many, many uh, little branchlets here, which we call an apical tuft. So this is dendrites that are gonna receive synaptic inputs. We also have down at the base of the pyramid, lots of dendrites as well. We call these basal dendrites. So these, Pyramidal cells are basically um, neurons that have two very elaborate areas for dendritic connections, synaptic connections, that are basically connected by this long apical dendrite. So how does that help? So this is a, a um, cartoon of a pyramidal cell and it's got its apical tuft, it's got its basal dendrites, you have an axon initial segment, and what's interesting about these two dendritic areas is they receive different types of inputs, qualitatively different types of inputs. To these top dendrites of the apical tuft, we get top-down afferents from higher order cortices, right? These are the inputs that are thought to convey updated expectations. On the other hand, we have in the basal dendritic field, we have these bottom up afferents. And these are coming from lower order cortices and they're thought to convey updated sensory input. And so these pyramidal cells based on their morphology are able to get both types of inputs. And an interesting feature of the, the physiology of these cells that was discovered um, 
in part by Dr. Matthew Larkham. Um, that's really interesting. And he was really the first person to show this experimentally that there's this electrical coupling between these apical inputs and these basal inputs that allows for some really cool interactions between these two types of synaptic inputs. So let's see what that looks like. So if we were to, to look at this axon initial segment, okay, and look at its voltage, right? And we would say, okay, at rest, the cell has maybe got a negative voltage of 80 millivolts. So that's close to one tenth of a, a volt. And if we were to activate synapses onto this, these top-down afferents to the apical tuft, what would this AIS see? Well, it wouldn't see very much. It would see a little tiny change in the, in the voltage. And that's because these inputs are so far away that whatever happens here has a hard time influencing something way down here, the, the axon initial segment. On the other hand, if we activate these bottom up afferents, we'll have an easier time getting this axon initial segment to fire an action potential, which is what we see here. What Matthew showed, which is really fascinating, is that there's a synergistic response when you pair input to this apical tuft with input to the, to the um, basal dendrite. So you pair top-down input with bottom-up input, and you get this robust burst from the pyramidal cell, right? So it can signal something special when there is a coincident input uh, on these top-down afferents with these bottom-up afferents. Now, this is just one cell, one neuron. We have tens of millions of pyramidal neurons, right? Spread across many different areas of the brain that subserve different functions and that exist at different parts of this hierarchy of cortical areas. So if we look kind of at that aspect of it, if we look at this pyramidal cell here and it's getting these top-down expectatory inputs from higher order cortices, and it's getting bottom up inputs from lower order cortices. And it has its own computation going on and its own output. That output is providing top down input to lower order cortical pyramidal cells. And it's providing bottom up input to higher order pyramidal cells. So this thing is just millisecond by millisecond. There's constant updates about expectation and there's constant updates about what we understand about the world around us. And that information is sent both directions, downward as expectations, new expectations, and upward as new understanding of, of what's happening in our perceptual or motor um, environments. So this type of, this type of um, interaction through millions of pyramidal cells at different hierarchical areas of cortex allow for this top-down influence on how we perceive things such as this checkerboard or how we perceive the color of this dress and allow us to interact very smoothly with a dynamic world around us. So um, I, I, you know, I hope that it, through this talk, you you know, gained a, an appreciation perhaps for, um, for how the neocortex allows for this constant updating of expectation and how important those expectations are in driving our understanding of the world and our decisions about what to do um, based on that perception. So with that, I'll stop there and turn it back to Dan. Alan, I just put a question in the chat, but I'll read it. Um, so then do you think this integration of expectation and reality exists all across, across all the cortical regions, even though the data hasn't necessarily been shown? And do you think it's um, in the higher order, like prefrontal cortex and other higher association yeah. regions? So the, high, the higher associational areas are the primary drivers of top-down um, mm -hmm. 
connections, right? They're, the, they're providing the greatest level of expectation. Um, and they're getting also the, the most full and elaborate bottom-up view of what's happening, right? They're the, the top dog, so to speak. So, um, and, and they're able to integrate multi-modalities, right? They're integrating different sensory inputs and different motor inputs and, um, and generating those expectations as well as generating um, a fuller understanding of what's happening right now. But a key part of the brain is trying to predict what's going to happen next. Right. Right. When you hear me speak, um, if I say I read my child a book, it was called The Cat in the Hat. When I say the word hat, you've already thought of that, right? It's you, the cat in the, and your brain is already anticipating hat. You know, if I said him, if I said I read him The Cat in the Banana, your brain would kind of freak out for a moment because that's not what it was expecting, right? So without thinking about it, without any conscious effort at all, our brain is trying to predict what's going to happen next. And that allows for a very smooth, hopefully, smooth interaction with the world. Can I ask a question? Yeah, Randy, please. Um, <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't bring this up, but I am dying with curiosity to see what you have to say about this. I'm wondering about the um, how you would comment about the impact, if that's the right way of putting it, that something like psilocybin would have on this whole process that you're speaking about. Right. So... Um... Psilocybin. It goes. Um, I'm basically speaking about Aldous Huxley's doors of perception, essentially. Right. So mm -hmm. if you, I mean, so if you use any kind of, um, if you manipulate the system, so psilocybin is going to activate two A receptors that are expressed by certain cells in your in your cortex, and cause them to maybe have um, more robust activity than neighboring cells, for instance, um, that will influence how that, how that process works. And these are mind altering drugs, right? So anytime you take any mind altering substance, whether it's alcohol or nicotine, um, you're going to change somewhat to different varying degrees how this process uh, occurs. Mm -hmm. um, Okay, okay. I think that it, I think that answers the question that I was wondering about. Can I ask another question? And I guess maybe if that's the last one. Um, do you think this feature is unique to the cortex, or do you think other brain regions also have a predictive um, quality? That's a really good question, and I don't know the answer. Yeah. Um, other. So one of the special things about the cortex is that it has so much feedback excitation. If we, if we were to look at the, if, if you were an alien who came to earth and you looked at a nervous system, you're likely to find nervous systems that are comprised mostly of GABAergic cells, inhibitory neurons, networks of inhibitory neurons, right? Because invertebrates have these tremendously Right? Invertebrates have these networks of inhibitory neurons, and they are great for causing um, kind of rhythmic patterned activity. So if you want to have a rhythmic motor activity, having inhibitory neurons that inhibit each other, and then that inhibition is released and they inhibit the other way, it works great. But mammals, especially vertebrates, but especially mammals in their cortex and part of the cortex called the hippocampus, have evolved these excitatory networks, which are really great for associational kinds of processing, but also are, are more prone to damage, right? If, you, if, you, if they get out of control, you have seizures, you have epilepsy. And so we're kind of like evolved to live on the edge where we have these great excitatory recurrent networks that are really good for learning and memory and information storage and predictions. Um, but are so excitatory that, that if something goes wrong through injury or genetic um, 
predisposition, uh, you get epilepsy, you get seizures, and, and that's maladaptive, right? So um, I think the cortex is a bit special in, in having that excitatory recurrent type of network that doesn't occur, say, in your basal ganglia um, and other places. Cool. Yeah, thanks for, um, that makes a lot of sense. Um, on that note, anyone else have any questions? And if not, we will move on to Don, who's our next speaker. Thanks, Don. Hey, everyone. Uh, let me just share my screen. All right, so this is the talk here. It's called the title of attention, but uh, which is, you know, a very broad topic. This isn't really meant to be like a comprehensive uh, you know, lecture, uh, you want to learn all the aspects of attention by doing and go through some of the interesting uh, components, especially related to visual attention. Um, and I'm, I'm using this uh, framework here, this model of attention, uh, different components of attention that were put in this paper by Eric Knudsen back in 2007. Um, and uh, this this guy, he's uh, I think he's at Stanford. Uh, he's uh, had a really uh, long, successful career, um, and I want I'll show some, a slide at the end uh, of some of his earlier work. It's really interesting. Um, but uh, so so anyway, his uh, this model here, uh, starting with uh, working memory. Oops. Uh, it, so in this component, this is uh, storing, temporarily storing information uh, for a detailed analysis. And the, the next level below that is a competitive selection where there, uh, where there's basically, um, this is deciding what is going to make it into the working memory um, because you can't pay attention to everything at once. Um, and some things are more important than others. Um, so this sensitivity control uh, component here is uh, a regulator of different streams of information. Um, and so allowing you to pay attention to either a certain part of your visual space or maybe to, uh, to auditory signals or so on, uh, or different characteristics of, of, of an image. Um, and then another part of this, uh, another component of attention in this model is a salience filter that enhances the responses to certain stimuli, uh, for example, that are infrequent in space or time or are of some biological importance, either instinctively or after learning. Uh, so some of the uh, brain regions, I just want to kind of label some of the important uh, regions that related to especially visual attention. Uh, so this is the DLPFC, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, uh, that is important for working memory. Uh, uh, the frontal eye fields, FEF, uh, and the posterior parietal cortex, or PPC, are important for things like uh, your gaze control, or you know where you're directing your eyes, or uh, where you direct your attention. Uh, even without moving your eyes. And, uh, and then these uh, V1, V2, and so on, V3, V4, goes on and on, lots of different visual areas uh, in your occipital cortex that are, uh, you know, where you process the visual information and where certain uh, bottom-up features, uh, you know, that uh, can, can grab your attention, uh, these the so-called salience filters. Um, all right, so so question is what is what is salience? It's um, kind of a weird word. Um, and if you look it up in the dictionary, uh, the definition is the quality or state of being salient, which is kind of circular and doesn't really tell you anything. Um, another definition from Pashler is the tendency to attract attention, which kind of gives you an idea of what that means, but still, you don't, you know, it, again, it's kind of circular. So it's you, what makes it about that thing that attracts your attention. Um, so a little bit more um, uh, 
useful definition, I think, uh, is this um, from Edie, distinct subjective perceptual quality, which makes some items in the world stand out from their neighbors and immediately grab our attention. Again, it really doesn't tell you, uh, you know, what about that stimulus uh, makes it stand out or makes it grab your attention. So there's been some, well, here's an example of a salient stimulus. You can see that dot moved, right? That it really jumps out at you. You weren't looking for motion. You weren't looking at that particular dot, but it really grabs your attention because uh, motion is, is, is a salient feature in, in lots of circumstances. Uh, here's another, uh, this red bar jumps out at you because it, you know, it's a different color than the rest. Um, and in here, the, this red bar jumps out at you because it's uh, oriented in a different direction. Um, so people have been uh, studying, uh, you know, what, what it is about stimuli that makes things uh, so-called salient or what, what makes it something grab your attention or, you know, what, this kind of experiment, you can uh, look at somebody's eye movements, you know, present a stimulus, a scene, and then see what they look at. Uh, or they're watching a video and you see what, you know, uh, where they're moving their eyes to, what is it that grabs their attention? And you can analyze uh, the different properties of the, the visual stimuli and you look at, uh, you know, intensity variance or color contrast or motion contrast. Um, and, and people can, you know, make models of, of the different visual features that would uh, be salient. And, and you can use that kind of modeling potentially to predict what stimuli in a given scene would be salient just based on the low level features. Um, this is kind of a joke, but um, this from this paper that they outline everything in red. And, and if you look, you know, it really jumps out at you. This is the kind of high contrast thing. But, um, I'm not serious about this one. Um, but so, this, uh, so this next thing is how, uh, you know, you have the, these salient features, but then um, you can also have top-down modulation of, of, of what actually captures your attention. Um, so a, a concept called contingent orienting. Um, so I basically break that down to that, say, if you're looking for an example, if you're looking for a particular type of target, uh, like something red, uh, and then there are uh, distractors presented, uh, something that's red would be more likely to attract your attention than a different type of distractor. Um, but there are uh, you know, lots of examples of ways that uh, the task that you're doing or the instructions that you're given or just you know, what you're trying to do uh, can influence what, um, what you're going to pay attention to, what jumps out at you. But so it's kind of a, uh, this balance between top-down effects uh, from uh, your higher level areas influencing lower level, you know, visual areas, for example, or features in the, in the stimuli that are, that are grabbing your attention going uh, uh, bottom up. Um, so I'm showing you this uh, just to uh, give you some background on the, the visual maps in the brain. These are from some um, from a paper back. Uh, Marty Serino was uh, my postdoc advisor, uh, UCSD. Um, so these are some nice maps made with fMRI, and uh, you can see back here uh, these uh, the blue and you know green, blue, red. They're different parts of the visual field, and you can see that so different parts of space are represented in different. Uh, you know, uh, regions of the cortex. So within this uh, central part here, this is uh, the V1, the primary visual area. And so you have a, a map of the whole visual field for one half of a hemi, of a hemi field. Um, you know, you, you map your, uh, the, the left side of visual space on your right hemisphere and your, uh, the right half of the visual field on your left hemisphere. Um, and, and if you, this is a map of eccentricity, so something that's uh, in the center of your visual field, 
you know, where your fovea is, when you're looking straight at something, uh, the, the activity is going to happen around the occipital pole. And then as you move farther out into the periphery, uh, the activity goes uh, out in these concept, you know, the concentric rings. Uh, so like, uh, yeah. Well, so, um, sorry. So here's an example of uh, attentional modulation. Um, where, so if, and, and this is uh, some work from uh, Monkey, uh, I think Macaque Monkey, where they uh, put electrodes in different brain regions and they record activity, uh, spiking activity in uh, neurons that are, you know, near that uh, electrode. Uh, so these little uh, dashes here are times when, the, when there's a firing of neurons in the vicinity of that neuron, of that electrode. Um, and uh, so if the monkey is staring at the uh, cross here, uh, or the, the dot in the center of the fixation dot, and then they're trained to pay attention to a particular part of space. Like they're given a reward if a stimulus occurs in, in a particular part of space. And so they have to respond when they see the, the stimulus happen there. So um, in this kind of experiment, then you can present the stimulus in, the, in that region where they're attending or uh, somewhere else. And you can see that when they are um, attending to a given spot and the stimulus is presented there, you get more activity than when they're attending uh, to a different part of the visual space. So they're, you know, they're, their eyes are looking in the same spot um, and they're seeing the same stimulus, but because of what their brain is, you know, what the, what the goal of their, what the task is, because they're, because they're attending over here and not over here, you get you know, a bigger or smaller uh, activity in, in that brain region. Um, and you can see in the uh, here in the V4 was particularly strong modulation. I think uh, actually I don't know what the, the difference between here, but anyway. Um, Don, can I ask a question that someone posted earlier? You used the term distraction. Um, how do you define distraction? I think you had it in one of the earlier examples or images. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, I guess if you were if you had a stimulus where you were going to uh, tell somebody to look for uh, uh, a vertical bar, uh, you know, these, these are all the distractors, you know, that these are the non vertical bars, uh, or, you know, if you were saying, look for the red, uh, the red bar, then, you know, you're looking for something red or a red, a red horizontal bar, if that's what you're, looking for, and then they presented a red, uh, uh, so there's a, looking for a red horizontal, and if they actually presented a red vertical bar over here, you know, it, it would grab your attention because you're looking for something red, uh, even though that's not the target, you know. Um, so it, it, it's sort of a, it's a stimulus, uh, kind of a stimulus presentation, experimental design kind of, um, uh, term that people use, like a distractor. It's either a target or a non-target. The non-target is like the distractor. Got it. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, so here is an example of attentional modulation using uh, ERP, the evoked re uh, event-related potential. Uh, also, sometimes called evoked response. Um, so this is from EEG. You know, so you have these uh, electrodes that are attached to the scalp, and you can measure these uh, brain potential, you know, outside the brain. So you're measuring from, you know, lots of the combination of, of activity from lots of different neurons at the same time uh, that are summing up, uh, you know, because you have, uh, say, like visual activity in a, in a certain spot on the cortex, and that's producing uh, a response that you can measure. So in here, this C1 is the, the earliest response uh, that's coming from uh, the primary visual area of V1. And then you have later 
response is uh, this like N1 component and uh, that, that can be um, attributed to uh, some of the um, later visual areas, um, like uh, say V2, V3 um, and so on. Um, but so this experiment, what they did was they had, like the monkeys, they have the, the subject attend to a particular, uh, say like the left hemisphere, the left hemifield. They say, okay, pay attention to stimuli coming over here. And when there's a, you know, a stimulus over here, a particular kind, you're gonna uh, make a response. Uh, you're gonna press a button. Um, and, but, and then they'll present stimuli all over the place and then you can compare the responses to either the attended location or the unattended location. And, and based on that, you can infer you know, the uh, attentional modulation uh, that's coming from this top-down effect uh, by you know, the, instructing the, the subject to pay attention to a particular part of space. And so that's uh, something that you can measure uh, non-invasively with EEG. Um, you can also measure this kind of attentional modulation using fMRI. So uh, here's an experiment where they uh, would have the subject again stare at the, the fixation cross in the center and then attend to a given uh, part of space. Uh, and then they'll present stimuli all over uh, and then compare uh, you know, the, the, uh, the bold response, this uh, blood oxygenation level dependent response that you measure with the fMRI um, and, and see you have more activity when you're attending uh, than when you are uh, you know, not attending. And, and so uh, this is a map of where, you know, what parts of, of your cortex are um, responding more when you're attending to that uh, given location. Um, now here's an experiment again with EEG uh, where they would have is a uh, uh, experiment where again they're they're uh, staring at this fixation and then attending to uh, like they'll get a cue to a given uh, a left or right um, target and then they are going to attend to that spot for the rest of the trial and. Uh, what they were able to measure here is a kind of a biasing potential that while they're attending left, uh, you get uh, a response that is uh, a little stronger. Uh, and if you're attending right, you uh, will have a response that's stronger on the on the left hemisphere. Um, so this is a, a demonstration of some of the timing. Of, of the modulation that's going on and also uh, doing some localization uh, using some information from fMRI to show that uh, these different sources of activation where showing some of the relationship with uh, these frontal eye fields. This is the general location of uh, those frontal eye fields and the posterior parietal cortex, uh, and those two regions being about, so it's showing some early activity in the frontal eye fields followed by uh, later activity in the parietal cortex. Um, and uh, here's a more, uh, another map showing the regions that are involved in shifting your attention. Uh, so either by moving your eyes uh, from one location to another, or by just holding your eyes uh, fixed in the center, but then just kind of uh, moving your attention back and forth, called covert attentional shifts, when you're not moving your eyes, but just your attention. And, um, and so this is a, a showing where you have like frontal eye fields and posterior parietal cortex and lots of visual areas uh, that are, are being modulated by, um, you know, of course, just from the, the eye movements, you're going to get uh, visual activity. But if you keep your eyes still, uh, you will you also get this modulation uh, by shifting your attention back and forth, and that's something that's you know under your conscious control. Uh, so that's really a, a top-down effect on um, the, the visual signals that are that you're going to receive. Um, 
So here's uh, an interesting experiment, again, from Marty Serino uh, some time ago, uh, demonstrating that there are maps of visual space in some of these higher level uh, posterior parietal cortex regions um, that are involved you know, in things like moving your eyes, moving your attention around. Uh, so you know, that these uh, maps uh, then are expected to be able to communicate back with the early visual areas and um, provide signals that would say like, uh, like these biasing potentials that we just saw with the EEG where uh, you could have uh, greater responses to stimuli that are in your left hemifield because you're attending over that way. Um, and, and so this, so back in 2001, this experiment was done with a, uh, imaging a surface coil that could only really look at the back of the brain back here, very localized signals. Um, but this, uh, this is from a more recent experiment that I did with Marty when I was a postdoc, um, looking at the whole brain signals that you, you get when you're doing either eye movements or keeping your eyes still, but doing a little pointing uh, with your fingers, uh, keeping your, your arm still, but then moving your finger to point to different uh, targets as they appear um, on the screen. And so that demonstrated also that there are maps in the frontal eye fields, uh, maps of visual space, and, and, and a whole chain of, of uh, visual maps in the parietal cortex. And these have been uh, demonstrated in, in a number of different uh, papers in different labs have looked at these different uh, maps, you know, beyond, so maps of visual space beyond the early visual areas. Um, and this is uh, another paper I did with Marty uh, a long time ago, but um, looking at maps even further forward in the dorsolateral prefrontal and as well as frontal eye fields. And these maps uh, were done uh, using a working memory task. Uh, the subject stared at a fixation cross, and then uh, there were pictures of faces that went around in a circle, and they had to, just using their peripheral vision, uh, pay attention to the, you know, the identity of the face and look for these two back matches and press buttons when they saw a two back match. And uh, while performing that task, uh, then this, uh, the faces going around, this is a kind of the, the mapping, uh, uh, one of the original mapping approaches for doing these visual maps is that you present a periodic stimulus and then can um, then find out uh, where a given piece patch of cortex is responding in the visual field um, based on the, uh, the periodic signal that you're measuring. Um, so now going back to kind of uh, a single uh, or down to the level of uh, you know neurons and, and activity. Uh, here's uh, an experiment in uh, monkey again, uh, doing this kind of uh, staring at a fixation cross, and then um, this is a there the monkey's uh, visual field for a given neuron that's being recorded from in a V4, and then at the same time they uh, they have an electrode that they're putting into the frontal eye fields. And, and applying some stimulation. And by doing that, they're able to um, uh, you know, change the, uh, the, uh, the saccade, the, the eye movement that they're making. Uh, they're able to, like the stimulus would be here naturally, and then they'll look at it. But then if uh, you have a misaligned stimulus that normally, I guess you wouldn't look at that, uh, um, the the stimulation will will modulate the the response that the monkey makes and um, um, change the the selectivity to the to the position um, kind of bias the the response that the monkey gets uh, based on the top down stimulation. Um, now, finally, here's this uh, slide I said I. Uh, show from some of the early work from Eric Knudsen uh, he did with uh, barn owls. Uh, he has uh, some uh, early, before this paper, back in the late 70s, he had a, 
uh, a paper that was uh, widely known that was um, demonstrating that uh, you can that that owls have maps of auditory space in their cortex and also in in different uh, 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 subcortical nuclei uh, that you know maps of location and space across the cortex and and they have this uh, method for uh, you know in a dark room they have this owl and they have a, a little magnetic uh, they have a, a coil with uh, that they can then using this uh, uh, magnetic signals from uh, currents in the coils they can tell precisely which way the owl is turning their head and if they present a uh, like a little uh, auditory stimulus like a kind of like simulating a mouse squeaking uh, you know they can the, the owl will turn their head and and very you know accurately localize where that sound came from um, and in this experiment what they did was they uh, put these uh, prisms uh, on to the uh, to baby owls like at uh, like at less than a month old uh, like after 10 days old they would put these uh, prisms on they would shift their visual field by a certain uh, like 11 degrees or 20 degrees they would shift it over so that they would be looking straight ahead but they would see something over over here look as if it were right in front of them and then they would wear these prisms uh, for like uh, three months or six months and get used to it and then uh, and and their brain would adapt and there there'd be this long-term plasticity that uh, now um, the the auditory responses, the the map of the auditory space would actually shift to match the bad visual information that they're getting the inaccurate visual information uh the auditory maps would shift uh sort of being dominated by the visual uh but also showing uh this plasticity that that can happen in the brain that's kind of you know i was talking about the tensional modulation that's a very short time scale but you also have this kind of top-down modulation that can happen at a at a much uh, longer time scale it could be potentially, you know, and part partly is related to mechanisms of adaptation uh, that could uh, follow some injury potentially. So that's why I thought it might be somewhat interesting as well. Uh, so that's that's the talk, and thanks for uh, for your attention. <laughs>